Great. Great. Yeah. So they, uh, these, this, they don't see yeah, just that. See. Yeah. Okay. Happy. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So I'm Jenna, for those of you who I haven't introduced myself to yet. Um, and for those of you online, I guess I'll wave. Um, so I've been doing a lot of work with group model building and participant oriented research. Um, today we're going to talk about in depth one case study and then kind of like a sprinkle of other case studies um, that kind of really highlight not only group model building, but participant oriented research in general. Yay, it works. Okay. So I use any excuse I can to show pictures of my son. That is Rand. He is very cute. He is now two. Um, I am a PhD student in computer science here at the university. Um, I started three-ish, three-ish years ago. So kind of what I have a, a roadmap that I like to show, again, using excuses to show pictures of my son because he's very cute. Um, who was building a road while we were camping. So I felt it was very fitting. Um, so I really loved working with communities and have always loved working with communities. And that kind of is what brought me along and kind of connected me with Nate. And we started work on my PhD. Um, so I do a lot of agent-based modeling, just for those of you um, who are interested in talking later or need help with that sort of stuff. That's why we're here. That's the big aspect of my research. But I really wanted to figure out how we could bring in all of the participant oriented research. And that then led to group model building and how we can kind of do that process. So really quick, um, we're gonna talk about like why group model building, what's the goods, um, what's the point, that sort of stuff. We're gonna do an intro to the really big case study that we're gonna look at today, um, go over it and like, quite a bit of detail. Um, I usually use this presentation for like people in health science and things who are like, hey, we're interested in looking at like getting this process started, what kind of steps are involved. So that's kind of like the recipe and formula that I'll be giving you guys today. Um, so there's, yeah, like the before, the during, the after, and then at the end, there's my bonus mini case studies, um, some featuring work of those in the room, some that was my own work. And again, really focusing on that participant oriented approach and group model building as a well. whole. So group model building, what, why, where does it kind of land in this whole world of systems thinking that we're kind of talking about today? So it's really group model building is a participatory approach um, and it can be used to enhance the understanding of a problem, right? Um, it's a systems thinking approach, helps kind of pull things apart, tease problems apart so that you can get a better understanding of a picture as a whole. Um, we're looking at, I think, well, Nate had mentioned talking about boundary objects, right? So when you do group model building, when you bring a bunch of people who have often very little experience of systems thinking and system sciences, they don't have 99% of the time any computer science background. Sometimes they don't have a grade 12 education, right? These are people that could be from like a million different backgrounds. They could be from health science, they could be from the community. And we're looking for this tool, this boundary object that is gonna be able to kind of be our center of focus and be able to bring all of these people together. So it's really, really important um, to kind of pick the tool that is gonna suit you best, the one that one you know best, because there's an element of teaching that goes along with it, and the one that's going to suit your problem the best too. So a couple tools that have, um, or types of models, even system models that have been used are causal loop diagrams, stock and flow diagrams is also one that I've seen used. Um, I'm going to go over causal loop diagrams in a little bit more depth, because that's the one that we chose as being for this day, like the good tool, the best tool for us. Other things that group model building does, um, it has that many brains in a room approach. So you get a really um, rich understanding of a problem. There's a lot of people coming at a problem from a lot of different perspectives. 
and it captures a story. I was in a seminar once. It was a very small group seminar and they had brought in an indigenous teacher and I really connected with what they had said. Um, so I like to share it kind of at the start of whenever I talk about group modeling is a really good reason as to like why we do this. Um, and that was that I was told once that some stories are just that, stories, but stories in context are medicine. They're being shared to provide change and a solution or healing to a problem. If we all share our stories and provide medicine to a problem that is too large to make an impact on alone, together we can then make a positive step towards our goal. So I really liked that kind of like reference to like how we can all share things and how it can really be like medicine to a problem. Okay, so jumping now into this case study, the one that we're gonna focus on today. So it was all about mapping systems for population, physical activity, promotion in BC. Um, so to give some, I guess, context here, there was COVID-19 pandemic, as many things tend to fall back into that. And that brought to light a lot of most flaws in our system that we didn't have to worry about before, but now we really did. Um, and it emphasized the need for renewed and strengthened health promotion and non-communicable disease, pre disease prevention in BC. So the BC Center for Disease Control, BC CBC, um, population and public health has a mandate to provide direction and support for health promotion and that non-communicable disease prevention. So this includes providing evidence-based practice and policy, policy support to provincial, regional, and then local partners and stakeholders. So kind of all of those tiers of government, right? Uh, currently, there was, I don't think there is still, really like clear defined roles within BC CDC on who was responsible for physical activity promotion. Everybody was kind of like, well, I think that that's that department's problem. So we're not gonna deal with it. And then everybody took that same approach and then nothing ever ended up happening. Or, you know, there was nothing that was um, working for BC CDC. So that's where this kind of core problem came from is there was a small group of people that sat down and said, okay, what can we ask all of our, you know, employees, all of our systems people to try and get at what, what they feel like they need to support a solution to this problem. And that's what they came up with here is how might we most effectively coordinate multi-sectoral population physical activity promotion at the provincial level and elevate physical activity among British Columbians. It's quite a mouthful. Um, but it really, really boiled down the essence of what they were looking at. They weren't looking at like, oh, we need to put more road infrastructure in to like promote that sort of stuff. That's not what they were there for. They were like looking at like a government level. What supports can we provide to you to allow you to do those things? So, um, do you need funding? Right. Of course, everybody needs funding. That's a money thing. That's an easy answer. But what other things is there communication barriers that you're finding you're having with in departments? Do you find that it takes too long to get meetings held? Like those sort of very like policy level approach to this problem. So we worked with a team of experts at UBC and BC CDC to plan and prepare for an event that brought many of those people that are impacted by this problem into one room. Okay, so then we picked our boundary object. That core thing that you really focus on when you talk about these problems. Ours was causal loop diagrams. And I'm gonna pause, I guess, pause a little bit from talking about the core problem and focusing on this boundary object and learning it with you guys just a little bit. Um, if you really love causal loop diagrams and wanna learn more about them, we have many slides that goes into lots of detail of, of exactly how they work, but we'll talk about them a little, little, little bit right now. So this is an example one, kind of fits the theme of what we're going, like what we've been talking about with some of our models and things today. Um, but it revolves around smoking and some of the elements or the story pieces that go with it. So in this diagram, we've got variables. So those variables often 
are nouns. And they're the pieces here that are like the text, right? So we have smoking. How is smoking of a person impacted in the system by all of these other elements? So we have, how is your health, health impacted? Again, those noun pieces, right? There could be so many more things in here. And if, you know, we sat down and worked together, we would end up with all of these variables that we feel like, okay, these are things that really contribute to this system. Now we have to think about how they're connected, right? So that's where these arrows come into play. And I know this seems simple, so apologies if you guys know this stuff already, but they're more like our verbs almost in the story that we're telling. So how does smoking impact nicotine addiction, right? So there's like this, this pathway um, between them, right? Smoking does something to nicotine ad addiction. And then we talk about how it impacts it, right? So, okay, when we look at this here, there's these like little plus signs and minus signs here that are attached to some of these arrows. And these are starting to explain the relationship between the two of them. So a positive connection in this case, on a technical level, it's an increase in the first var variable. So if there's an increase in your smoking, it's gonna cause an increase in the second variable. So an increase in your nicotine addiction compared to what they otherwise would have been. Kind of like not looking at anything else, just like looking at your smoking and looking at your nicotine addiction. If that connection would cause an increase compared to what a, it whether otherwise would have been, that's a positive relationship, right? A positive connection. Some people like to think of that as like a positive, connection is the same versus a negative is the opposite. But that's kind of, again, depends on who you talk to, which system modeler is talking, I guess. Um, there's the opposite, though, that is that negative relationship. So we have a commitment to cessation or, yeah, I think that's a reasonable, I like the smoking to health one. That's an easier one to understand sometimes. So we have smoking and its relationship to your health or just health in general, right? So when we think about when your smoking increases, what do we think of when we think about health? So if your smoking goes up, what do you think happens to your overall health? Goes down, or a couple goes down. Yeah, exactly. So again, it's that almost like an opposite connection. But how we define that is that an increase in the first causes a decrease in the second of, or vice versa. Um, so if we think about it in the context of if your smoking goes down, what happens to your health? Overall, all other, no, nothing else considered, just looking at those two. If your smoking goes down, what happens to your health? It goes up. So it becomes this like inverse relationship, right? This opposite relationship. Um, so this negative sign doesn't necessarily mean that there's always like a negative. So smoking goes down, health goes up, but the other is true. Smoking goes up, health goes down, right? So both of those are true when we look at that sort of negative relationship. When we kind of put all of these things together, now we start ending up with pathways, right? So we're connecting arrows. So we no longer just have one. We have two, we have three, and we end up with these pathways, these loops, these connections. And when you end up with many, many, many variables and many arrows and many loops, um, you start to be able to kind of look at these as a system of behavior. As we go through and you see kind of how complex some of these diagrams can get from some of the outcomes of this group model building event, we'll really be able to see, okay, yeah, like this is, this one is a simple, you know, one for explanation purposes, um, but it can get quite complex. And it's really interesting to see how we can start to relate some of these pieces together. So I don't think, again, if there's interest um, in looking at, again, what loops mean, what there's this element of feedback loops where things feed into each other and cause things to like, kind of 
happen in a system, if any of that is of like great interest, until Nate, and then um, we can make sure that we can talk about it more. Yeah, only if it's of interest. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of pieces that go into it, but I just wanted to mention those really, I guess, the basics of it, which is looking at the variables, the nouns, how they're connected, those arrows, those verbs, and then how those arrows impact the things, like kind of what that means. When we teach this sort of stuff, that's kind of the basics that we give people. Um, we don't always in, like impose, I guess, on them the, oh, now you have to start looking at feedback loops and stuff. Um, we usually gradually add that on throughout the day. So this is kind of where we start. Then we say, okay, you are released now. Let's look at the system together. Let's talk about it together and kind of build on what you guys think this story looks like. Once we have a more like complex diagram, then we kind of take a pause and we go, okay, let's look at this together. Now let's look at the stories that you guys are starting to create, right? Do you feel like these, you know, looking at this long pathway now that now includes seven, 10, 11 different variables, do you feel like this is like an accurate representation of what you feel actually happens? Um, and we can start looking at that in such like a bigger scale um, that normally your brain by itself has a lot of trouble kind of getting it. Okay, so jumping back in the problem then, or maybe I'll pause, I'll pause. Is there any questions kind of so far or thoughts on like causal loop diagrams and things like that? Mentioned oh, the, yeah. the double blue bar means from smoking to health. Sure, yes. Um, so when you think of smoking and its impacts on health, um, what that double blue bar means, it's a computer science thing. So some of you might be familiar, but it's like a technical term. I can say in, I guess, layman's terms is that it means that that action to that kind of consequence, there's like a delay. And so that it, it, it represents a delay in time where like smoking to your nicotine addiction, the more you smoke, it's a relatively immediate impact compared to time on your nicotine addiction, but smoking and health or your health outcomes, it could be like a relatively delayed response. So that's what that double bar means. Um, for example, if you end up with lung cancer because of your smoking like habits, it's not gonna be something that happens tomorrow or even in a week. It could be something that happens many years down the road. Double bar. Any other thoughts or comments? Okay. Jumping back in then. Okay, so before the big day, there's lots and lots and lots of planning that goes into hosting and doing a group model building event. Um, sorry, touching things. Okay. There was even months of research and planning done before I even jumped into this project. So I can only do it a little bit of justice um, explaining exactly kind of all the steps they took. But they started doing, I think, small, almost like focus groups to tease out the problem, get people's feedback, get what they really wanted to talk about during that day. They even went into the literature, pulled out everything that's been done. Um, and they started putting together what they kind of called or had as this like master list of all possible variables that might be kind of impactful on the problem. They wanted to hit the ground running at the start of this event with being able to provide our participants, which is about 25-ish people, um, with a list. They were like, hey, we've talked to you guys at least one-on-one. -on -one. We've looked at the literature. Here is a list of everything that you felt is important to this problem. Let's start brainstorming around this list now. Um, there's pros and cons to that. It helped us to really jump into the day. Um, but of course, now you're giving people something to start with. So there might be a little bit of not leading, but again, you're starting with something, right? You've got them. It might be harder to come up with new variables now. So pros and cons to everything, but it really did help us kind of jump in on the day of. Um, the one point here 
that are the two bottom points, I guess, resources and trial run events um, are very much a logistics perspective. So we've run these events before, but there's always an element of like, okay, we're going into a new setting. We went to the like UBC campus and we were like, we don't know what resources are going to be available to us. We know what we usually use, which is we have lovely giant white boards that like live in all of our rooms and we have dry erase markers and we have all the things that are very easily accessible and work really well to communicate ideas to, you know, a group of people effectively. Um, but we, at the very least, knew that we weren't going to have whiteboards in this room. So we had then to brainstorm, okay, how do you, like, communicate large ideas dynamically, having them allowed to be changed and things like that to a group of people um, without the use of whiteboards? And I know it seems simple, but there, so we kind of trial run some different options. So like paper, string, arts and crafts for those who um, are really invested in that sort of stuff. And we tried dry erase boards on windows because we knew that there was going to be giant windows in this room. And we tried a whole bunch of things throughout kind of like the leading weeks up to this event. Um, and I'm focusing on this because without those trial run events, we would have got to this room and we would have said, okay, Sure, we decided to use um, sticky notes and butcher paper and strings or markers, like um, Sharpie markers, right? And if we had decided that, we would have run into the problems that we ran into with these trial run events, which is strings, great in principle, because they can be moved around easily and stuff like that. And then you run into the logistics of somebody sitting there cutting string for 10 minutes when they're supposed to be working collaboratively to solve a problem, right? It takes away from the problem. Or you have somebody with a Sharpie, okay, well, I'm gonna dish those strings, I'm done now. And then they start making lines and then they go, oh, wait a second, I actually feel like this is more connected to this, this other variable. Well, now it's Sharpie on a piece of paper. And so either we have to cut new pieces of paper or do all this new stuff. And again, it's all these weird small technicalities that can really draw back from a group model building event being really successful. Um, I guess our outcome of that is that we found, which I didn't know existed, um, sticky note whiteboard things. <laughs> they're like giant whiteboard that whiteboards that roll up and they're created by like Post-it Note, the company, and they actually like stick to walls. Um, so super handy, great to then trans like transfer a whiteboard to an area that doesn't have one. Um, really easily removable because they're just kind of like that sticky note backing. Um, and you can just roll them up and take them off. So again, without all of that like kind of trial run pieces, we wouldn't have been able to kind of get to that solution before the day of. Um, and it would have been a really big drawback Still would have been a good day, but not as good as it could have been. Okay, so all of that preparing, all of that um, previous work brought us to the big day. Here's our group of lovely people. Um, and this is kind of how we decided to break up the day. So we took the first couple hours of the morning to ground ourselves in the core problem, introduce the literature, introduce the variables, make sure that everybody was really, really familiar with the problem that we're, we were there to kind of solve together. Um, we did give like literature packages and things like that beforehand, but we didn't have the expectation that they reviewed it. We requested, of course. Um, but these are busy people. Sometimes these are people with, you know, in this case it wasn't, but if they're community people with lived experiences or you're working with people who have... Um, long COVID symptoms, for example, and they have brain fatigue and stuff, there's amount of burden that you have to be really conscious about giving to your participants and you don't wanna burn them out before the day even starts, right? So you have to be very conscious of that. Um, so we took time to ground in the core problem. Then we learned the boundary object. So the causal loop diagram kind of stuff. Um, we took time just before lunch. Then we took a break, fueled our brains, fueled our bodies, 
went for a little walk, made sure that we took care of our participants, and then came back after, kind of did a refresher on everything we just talked talked about quickly, and then we got into like the core of the step, the group model building, coming together and addressing the problem um, with the tools that we had been given. So I've been, I had kind of, I've talked about the variables, right? Um, and how this group, again, not the norm, kind of unique to this project, that they had come up with this quite extensive list of variables that they wanted to give the group beforehand. Um, they really wanted to utilize all of the work that they had previously done. And we knew that if we had just handed them 45 variables and said, go, that's that's also not going to work, right? That's really overwhelming. So what we ended up doing is we kind of created this, I don't know, it's not created, it was a dotocracy type system, right? Um, and we utilized that. So we had all of the variables up on a board and we gave them time to reflect on them. And we gave everybody little shiny star stickers and we said, okay, now looking at these variables and looking at this approach, which one to you yourself doesn't have to be from your, you know, um, whatever background you're coming from, that can have an impact on it, but you yourself as well, which of these pieces do you feel kind of are most impactful on this problem we're solving today? So we gave them time and um, everybody kind of mulled it over and took their little star stickers and put them on the ones that they felt best represented the problem or most contributed to the problem in some way. With that, um, over lunch, <laughs> we quickly um, tabulated all of those numbers, all of those results, and picked kind of the, the top 14 that really stood out as like, these are the ones that clearly have the most interest, people feel are most relevant to the problem. And we took those and broke those into three groups kind of very intentionally so that those would then be the starting points for these groups. Now they're working with like four to five starting point variables, a lot more digestible to think about. And we were able to, um, or three groups of six. Okay, so six variables, but yes, um, a lot more digestible as a starting point, right? Um, and we also kind of overlapped almost some of those variables when we split them up so that when we, as a team, looked back at what was created, that there was some kind of connecting points through each of the three diagrams um, so that we could draw some of the conclusions that they made separately back together. Is there any questions? I guess I'll pause here again so far about kind of like the process in the day um, or anything up until now. Okay, I will continue on. So this was the variables. I just wanted to highlight it because it was pretty unique to this project. This is definitely not where everybody starts with these. Usually core problem is the big one. You really need that when you do one of these days, but these, this part, the variables, if you have it, it's it's a pretty cool tool, but it's not um, hypercritical to having a good group model building event. Okay, so then we built the models. Um, we had three groups working in tandem. You can see all of our fun resources, right? These are those fun post-it note dry erase markers. We had some of the variables all printed out already on cue cards so that we didn't have to worry about people having to write everything out. Um, we had extra paper, we had all the fun things, we had markers, um, and we just made sure that everybody felt very, like, empowered to be able to go up to a whiteboard and really put down their thoughts, their ideas, um, because that's what it's about. We have all of these people in a room, right, and we really, really want to hear their voices. Uh, when you run this sort of event, a person who you might not immediately think of, but is incredibly key to having this be successful, is ensuring that there is a really good facilitator almost, right? So there's the people who are running the event and you get busy, right? If you're hosting an event like this, 
you get busy. So you need to have that team with you that's going to be able to stand next to these groups who are, you know, working in front of a whiteboard, thinking about their problem, um, talking it over, who one really knows the problem already, and who knows the process really well already too. Because there's going to be lulls in conversation, right? This is a new process for all of these people in the room. They're going to have anxieties towards like, well, I know you just told us all the things, but I don't actually really know where to start. So you need somebody who can really communicate those things, um, kind of prompt the idea sharing without doing it themselves. You know, of course I could be like, oh yeah, I'll just go do it. Here's the connections, here's all that stuff, but that's not what you want either. You want those people's stories. So you need somebody who's going to be able to kind of almost, some cases it's pulling teeth, not always, um, but to prompt people, to make sure everybody's voice is heard, um, to quiet really loud voices in a group, right? Sometimes there's people who just like, they got it. They're like, I know everything to this problem and I've got a lot of ideas and those people are awesome and valuable, but they can sometimes put a shadow over top of people who are a little bit quieter, right? So having a facilitator who's really good at those people dynamics, really knows the problem, really knows the process, super, super critical to what's going on. We also, when we split up the groups, um, made sure that there was people from a variety of backgrounds in, of, in each. So if you have that luxury, we had people from health, from policy, from transportation, um, from different communities around BC. So we tried to kind of uh, give a good assortment in each group too, to bring all the different perspectives as best as we could. Um, other things that are really important. Ah, they're kind of hinted at it, but there's the big voices in a room, right? Um, really loud, really vocal. Are there sometimes not because they believe in the process, but because they think uh, that, that it is a really big problem, but it will never be fixed. Sometimes is the voice that they have. Um, they can sometimes voice things a little bit more negatively than other people. And there's always, always people in a room that are like that. And you just have to make sure that you're, you yourself as a presenter and facilitator are prepared for that. Um, but not to be scared of those voices because often those really loud, those really big voices, if you can teach them and guide them and, and listen to them, because a lot of times those big voices are there because they haven't been listened to, right? There's a reason they're so big. Um, and if you give them that listen and that validation that they've been looking for the whole time, they can be some of your biggest investors. They are the ones who are now the most passionate about one, taking this, what you did in that group back to their group and being like, hey guys, I know that I've been kind of a pain in the butt about this before, but like, this was awesome. We talked about this. I really fe felt heard. I know what they're going to do with this knowledge. There's a piece of knowledge translation, right? You can't just take from them and be like, okay, hey, cool, bye. They know that there's going to be things kind of coming out of this. We are really intentional about like, this isn't just for fun. We really want to take your knowledge and use it so that we can create solutions to the problems you guys have. And so at the end of the day, that person um, can often be the most thankful towards you guys, can be the most excited for the next steps because um, they can see a lot of value and potential for change. So these were the CLDs, the causal loop diagrams that actually came out of the process. Um, the three groups, I was a little nervous about them, some of them, um, when they first started. Um, and the nerves, I mean, you want to have a good day, right? As a facilitator, I probably would have been nervous no matter what. Uh, but they all got to their causal loop diagrams in their own way. And they were all so rich and um, really told the stories that they kind of had inside of them. And it was really, really quite cool to see. Um, for example, one of the groups 
uh, was super dynamic at the start. They put down variables, connection super quick. Um, I looked at the other two boards and they had two things down and this group had almost a complete one. And I was like, oh no, what's happening to the other groups? But at the end of the time, it ended up being where they all really ended up in the same place. Um, there was another group that had one of the more boss people in it, right? And it's always a little nerve wracking when you've got like the boss person, the person who makes sure that I get paid in the same group as you and you're talking about a problem, right? Um, and we were a little nervous there, but we had kind of strategically talked with him beforehand saying, hey, this is what we're doing. This is how the process goes. And um, the facilitator in that group too was really intentional about, you know, creating the, the good dynamics. And so everybody's voices was um, kind of heard and we ended up with some really, really cool stories along the way. This process does come up with these results, right? But it's also about the steps we took to get here. So we had conversations with these people. Um, they told us the stories in their personal lives that are related to these arrows, right? So making sure you take time to appreciate that process itself, um, whether or not you end up with a good causal loop diagram at the end can make for a really, really successful group model building event, right? You're getting participant feedback, you're getting people's feedback, you're getting information on a systems problem that you couldn't answer yourself. So yes, we have things that we look at at the end, but even if we didn't, I just want to emphasize the importance of kind of going to a community and going through this process and being intentional. Um, and even if you just have those stories without these pictures, that itself is super, super, super valuable. One of these here has actually two causal loop diagrams. It's in the top corner here. Um, and I'll just take a minute, I guess, to, to talk about how that one was created. So it's, again, this one right here. Kind of looks a little different than everybody else's, right? It is truly marker Sharpie on a piece of paper beside one that looks kind of like everybody else's. And this was a cool experience to see um, from a system science person or like, you know, I've done a couple of these events and it's really, really cool to see somebody who gets so invested and just gets the process and is like, yeah, I love this. Um, and that's what happened here is there was one of the group participants and he, not that he was getting super overwhelmed, but he was starting to hear stories in the other groups. And so he kind of left his group um, and wandered down the line of all the different, you know, causal loop diagrams that were happening. And he started to be like, oh, there's themes here. I'm hearing the same stories from each group. And so he came back to his group and created this at an overarching kind of level is really what I'm seeing happening in all of these things. We're all calling it maybe slightly different names or, you know, there are different elements to the system that are contributing to these areas. But this overall is really how we find this kind of sustained political leadership in this area, which I thought was really cool. It's just like a really great or exceptional example of how this process can guide people or help them really pull out um, understanding to a problem that they wouldn't have otherwise been able to do. Okay, so we've taken this time, we've built all these causal loop diagrams, we've done a ton of work to get to the day, the day is done and you go, okay, good. We're done. But in reality, that's not how research goes. You do a bunch to get a bunch of data and a bunch of um, really unique um, solutions to a problem. And then you got to do a lot of stuff with them, right? And we wanted to make sure that we took that knowledge that they had given us and taken the time to give us that day um, and really utilize it well, right? It's super important to not just leave it at, okay, cool, we got the event, we'll write a paper about how it went, and we're done. It's like, no, no, no. Let's take the time. They took the time to come to us. We really have to respect and appreciate that knowledge, right? So we took all of those CLDs. Um, we put them into software and programs. Um, we kind of 
teased and twined them together. We had recorded, they knew this, um, some of the conversations that they had, and we got them all to kind of talk about their CLDs at the end, and we recorded all of that um, and to make sure that we got their like kind of like text-to-speech stories as well that went along with these things. We learned from those discussions, and we started building a causal loop diagram that could help us identify leverage points and then give back recommendations to like BC, CDC on really answering that core problem, right? So <laughs> this is what it looked like to start. And again, we everybody starts somewhere. Um, this, it was a lot, right? And we were like, okay, how do we best put them together? This looks like spaghetti on a plate. This is clearly not gonna work, but it this is truly like, when we took every single person's thought and put it on a plate, this is it, right? Um, clear example as to why sometimes systems thinking is required, um, because if we were to even think about conceptualizing this on our own without a picture, impossible. Like it's um, all of the different connections and dynamics that are related, it's totally way out there. So what we did is we went, okay, we have these 14 core variables that we kind of had got from them. Let's see where those play into it. All these different colors represent um, connections that like different groups had made. I came up with like some color coding system to try and help you figure out what was going on. Um, and this was then the 14. So it actually ended up being that like some of them, as much as they were like, these are really important they actually didn't have any connections to the other ones. So it was like, okay, now do we go backwards? Do we go forwards? So I tried um, a lot of different combinations, looking at the different kind of connection points. Okay, this variable has a ton of arrows going to it. So it's clearly a really important leverage point. There's a lot of connections happening. Let's look at those. And again, playing with all of these different combinations of things. Um, and we kind of boiled it down this one and I still think this is not quite the one that was published because we have finished come to now finish this process um but we removed the color at this point we were like hey we're joining groups together we made things grayscale we really were trying different ways to kind of look at it and look at the polarities of the arrows and at this point I didn't talk about it as much at the beginning but those loops looking at the stories to the start and the finish um and knowing that, okay, this variable is like highly connected, like this one down at the bottom, which um, ended up being the quality of cross ministerial collaboration. Um, and then there was some others too, where they were kind of making connections of like, well, the government in power actually really indicates and like kind of has impact on some of these things too. Um, but we don't have control over the government and who is in power, but we have control over some of the pieces that are connected to that or that come out of it, right? So we can start looking at what do we have control over, which of those that we have control over can make the most impact on a system and the changes we want to see. And then that's how you kind of start teasing out, you follow the stories, you follow the paths, and you're able to identify exactly what's going on. And um, this little one, is the one that I kind of had highlighted that that one individual had gone back and kind of been like, hey, this is what this is overarching story um, is what I think is going on in the whole picture. I did put it in because I wanted to um, kind of see what it looked like compared to everything else. So I thought I would share it with you guys, which is pretty cool. Okay. And then this was the final product. Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, oh. Um, Knowledge translation, KT knowledge translation. Yeah. So um, yeah, knowledge translation, that's what that one represented. How do we communicate to the public? How do we communicate within the ministries? That sort of stuff. How do we share the knowledge that I have with everybody else in an effective way? Yeah, no problem. Okay, so this is what came out of it. Um, one of the cool things about this paper is that we have a lot of names on here and oops, go back. A lot of names on here and only like 
three of these are kind of like the lead team. All these other people are people who were involved in the group model building process. So we wanted to make sure that they felt like their knowledge was heard, that we were giving them full, almost like credit or like, hey, you guys helped us with this. Do you want to co-author this paper with us? Like, we'll do the writing and stuff, but like feedback or anything, you were highly involved in this process. How does that sound? And everybody was like, yeah, that's awesome. That's so cool. And so that was another thing that like is a way that us researchers could give back to this team is like, hey, this is us honoring you guys and the time and effort that you spent helping us with this. This is one way that we can do that. So let us do that for you guys. Um, so that's where some of these names come from, which is pretty cool. Um, so before I jump into all my mini case studies, uh, this is kind of, I guess, my formula for a group model building event. Um, we have the before, the during, the after, and kind of I highlighted some of those key points that really bring a day together. So we've got the before. So we've got the identifying of the core problem, choosing of your boundary object really carefully, and then practice, planning and practicing. Don't just jump into an event not having done this process before. Even if you've done this process before a million times, do it with your core problem because people are going to have questions about it, right? And if you can field some of those questions in a kind of a safe setting beforehand, you're going to be able to then either explain it better, kind of fine tune it, tweak it, run into maybe some of the areas that are um, a little bit sometimes controversial, depending on what core problem you have, right? Come up with plans to deal with them. Um, there's the during, always returning to the core problem. We made a huge emphasis on the core problem. People go down rabbit holes happens. Your brain has a story it wants to tell. Um, so we always related everything that we were doing back to the core problem. We printed it out on this huge poster board so that we could be like, hey, remember, this is what we're here for. How does this relate? I love what you're telling me. How does this relate back to the core problem? You know, we're using language kind of like that. Um, solidly introducing the boundary object, fostering discussion and ideas, listening to those stories. That's why you're there for the day. And then after, um, Lots of learning, identifying of the leverage points, right? Relating it back again to that core problem, super critical at the beginning. Um, and then going back to your group, right? That KT, the knowledge translation piece. Uh, if people are involved in this process and they love it during the day of, and then you disappear, they're never gonna do it again, right? They were like, they just like, they were here, they did stuff. I have no idea what, why was I here today? I'm, I don't want to do this again if there's absolutely no, like, follow-up with me. Like, there's no follow-up with what I put effort into. So super huge, super important. Giving back to the communities that gave to you. Okay, so that's group model building. And that's kind of like a really in-depth look at how that one event sort of went. Um, before I jump into, I have, I think, five mini case studies. Uh, before I jump into those, well, maybe, is there any questions about like group model building events as a whole or anything like that? Yeah. You mentioned the importance of like sort of uh, moderators for the group. Yeah. How did you, how did you encourage them to do their job in a way that like facilitates the model building? Totally. So we were there a couple days early, um, and the moderators we had the luxury of having a big enough planning team that we could use our planning team, um, but training almost for your moderators is super important. Whether they've been involved in some of your trial run events, that's a good way. Um, you can see kind of the dynamics of those people and start to pick the ones that you're like, ah, you are really good at group conversation or like you are really good at fostering others' ideas and you can kind of start to kind of come up with your team. Um, Sometimes you only need one or two. Like if you don't have a super big group, you don't need, like, I think we had four kind of of these moderators or facilitators. You don't always need four. Sometimes you only need two. Um, but training, that's kind of what we found is like the practicing of the events, giving them some like breakdown of like, this is what you need to do. This is what you really should not do. Um, yeah, that sort of stuff is how we, how we kind of tried to make it work the best. Like, 
Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay, good question. Okay, so um, I'm gonna bump back to the picture that I have. These ones, okay. So when we look at these, the variables, um, do you see how there's almost like color coordinated aspects? So these relate to different elements of the system. I think one was finances, one is more political, one is more resource oriented. Like. There was um, strategic, I guess, like breakdowns. And one way to pick them was we wanted to make sure that we included variables in each of these kind of sectors of importance. Um, how we even got to the list to start, there was, and these are, I think it was like 43 or something here. The first list was like 273. <laughs> so it's it's a serious process. Um, it like it took four months or something to actually come down to these 43. Uh, it was literature review. So pulling out words that are kind of common through different articles, kind of like doing that sort of uh, piece. We did uh, interviews, like personal interviews with some of the people who were gonna be there as well as some of the people who couldn't. Um, and then again, pulling out common words and then not only the common words, but trying to be like, okay, they said this slightly different, but it's actually the same as this person. So then picking the words and putting them together. Um, and then having that really huge giant list, it was like hundreds and hundreds of variables. Uh, and then as a leadership team, which again was, a, we had the luxury of it. It was like five people, five or six people. Um, we sat down and went, okay, looking at the core problem, which ones do we know for sure we can call out? So then we were able to do a few that we called out, right? So we got it down from 273 to maybe 200. Um, and then we had a couple people who were um, kind of more in the academia field or people who had said, I actually have more time to volunteer um, to like help you guys with this. So we went back to kind of uh, like one separation removed from our team, sat down with those people said, this is what we're looking at. Which ones are really important to you? Um, and then again, from that field, we knew, okay, these are the really important ones. We'll take out another layer and that taking out of a layer doesn't mean that they didn't necessarily end up in the final product because we emphasize that, Hey, these I know are like printed out on a cue card. These are what we're starting with. But if at any point you feel like you need to add something do, because we don't have a complete picture. That's why we're here and why we're talking about it add in your guys's perspective. So I'm sure that some of the variables that were called out per se um, were probably brought back in. I actually never went back and did that. It might be interesting, but yeah. Um, any interest in using like a hive of agents uh, to see if it comes up with the same map as what your hive team of people did? If you've got all of this source literature and everything else? And how well does a hive of agents or a hive of experts come yeah. up with a set of like actual physical carbon based life forms? I mean, I know I hadn't thought of that, but I that okay, hadn't, but um one of our leads on the team just was like in love with Chat GPT at the time. Um and actually said, Hey Chat GPT, can you make a cause loop diagram that is about this core problem? And uh gets close but so you can get something there's starting points yeah. there 100 percent. yeah which not quite the same but sort of yeah, I know yeah. I say nine months to get 80 percent of the problem solved <laughs> uh, yeah i yeah. mean there's 80 percent of the problem yeah so you've been talking a lot about how the focus is stories in, in this case and chat gpt yep. i don't know if it has much of a story uh, that's itself. that's where it can't yeah but, it uh, can't. although it could actually it could be useful in kind of like prototyping work and kind of first draft or something right? yeah instead of doing the million months and the million interviews of to get this set of variables i could see where that could be a really great starting point and be able to do that kind of in an automated way um yeah, and then you've got your variable reductions, that principal component yeah. analysis. How do you go from, you know, your 240 or yeah. variables down to a, a workable handful? Yeah. You 
So you'll have all your orthogonalities of, of variables in there to, to reduce that scope. Yeah. So it's my bet is a lot of those are going to be semantically the same idea yeah. and that's another place where a height of agents would be. Yeah, really good to do that. Really yeah, good. totally. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, that's cool, yeah. Um, are you at all familiar with Scriptopedia? Have you used it for group model building at all? Have not. Okay, no. did you know about it? Uh, I have heard about it, but I don't know enough to, you know. I'll, I'll show you. Okay, okay, cool, <laughs> thanks, Eric. <laughs> Online, uh, wanted to say it's amazing that you were able to brainstorm with that many individuals with diverse ideas, and the initial list of variables were very long. Uh, wonder what was your mental process to distill the number of variables and turn this to a systems model? Mm. The did I? I guess I'll ask. Did I answer that question kind of from Nona's question too? This one was this after after the Nona's okay. question. So. I think they're more so curious about the... it, but not how. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, I guess I will also admit that that process was not me, so I will do my best to explain it. Um, they, okay, the very logistics of it is I'm pretty sure is they printed it out and they had probably a serial killer like map on their wall. <laughs> I know that's wild and crazy, but that's how this person processed. Um, and they started reading everything reorganizing them reading them again um this is why it took like many 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 months um she was hired on to this project like as a like a research student and that was her job though is to kind of come up with this list so those many months of time spent there that was what she lived and breathed uh it's not something i guess to be undertaken lightly and it was there was no automated system to it at all. And I do agree that there is 100% an automated system that could could be very well utilized. Um, and it was reading one variable after the other, figuring out, classifying them, um, and just that iterative process. It was a super iterative approach, getting rid of handfuls at a time, coming back to the group the next week, saying, okay, we're gonna approach this next smaller subset of variables which ones do we like, which ones don't we like, taking those out, doing it again and again, and the many months um, kind of built into that. I hope that helps. Um, I know I don't know as much about the process, but I want to emphasize too that this starting point of a variable list, you, you don't need it. It was cool to have, and it was really cool to see, and it gave a different perspective and approach, but if you don't have months and months and months and months to do, one, you could attempt an automated approach that might only take like a handful of weeks to kind of get up and do and check out. Um, or you can just really focus on that core problem, making sure that that's really well defined so that when people come in, they know what they're answering um, and you don't necessarily need this like huge extensive list of variables to build off. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? pop back over to my other stuff. So what time are we at in terms 10.08? Okay, so I've got about- know that if you don't yeah. have it, you're removing a lot of the guardrails for your- Yes, 100%. Um, your facilitator becomes a lot more important in terms of focusing. Um, you have to be creative about redirecting rabbit holes because you haven't protected yourself against them. Yeah, very, very true. No getting out of doing the work. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I've got about 20 ish minutes more left of information um, for you guys. This stuff is all on participant oriented research. Some of it is causal loop diagram, some of it is more just kind of more of the focus on participant. Um, and I kind of have, I guess, what I would call a highlight um, out of all of these. Uh, there's kind of like a, yeah, a pull away point from each that I want to kind of focus on. Um, I'll give a brief description of each study and then kind of that pull away point. So this one here, the first one we're going to talk about is service dogs and veterans. Um, that's Ruby for all of you who are interested. She's a good girl. <laughs> um, and she is a service dog that was 
starting to be trained. They were all, okay, 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 pausing, 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 going backwards in my brain. Service dogs and veterans. So these are all veterans who dealt with PTSD or symptoms of PTSD. And these service dogs, the goal was to bring in dogs, have the veterans train their own service dogs to develop customized um, or like the kind of response indicators to help stop PTSD events and things like that for themselves. So these were dogs that were not trained service dogs to start. Um, this is a program called Audiomus, and it's still going on like in the city and in Alberta as well. They've had a lot of success with it, um, but they this was done five years ago when they were kind of like, we were like going, okay, how do we build, I don't know, kind of a foundation of knowledge around this stuff? Um, how do we gain buy-in from government to provide funding? How do we say, hey, service dogs really have an impact on these people. Let's make sure that we provide the proper training, accessibility, resources. Like what can we do to make sure we get where we're going? So we brought in a team of veterans and we started right from the beginning of like, okay, this is our goal, um, but we need you to tell us what's gonna work for you because you guys have a lot going on in your life already um, and we don't wanna make this work. And we want this process to be one that we can replicate and be able to do again and again and again and be able to make this project and, and this work kind of accessible across many places. So we had them tell us what types of data collection was okay, what type of data collections actually increased or triggered their PTSD um, and made it worse. And so then we were able to really kind of fine tune how we're going about getting information that we needed to be able to kind of push this project forward in the eyes of research and government people who like numbers and all of those sort of things. Um, so that we can get funding to make it bigger. So what we see here on these little puppy dogs color is a Bluetooth beacon, which is kind of fun and different. Um, but we knew that this piece right here would allow us to track how much time a veteran is actually spending with their service dog because we have the ability to track beacons with our phones. So we can see um, at the start before they're, you know, um, Kind of starting the training, how much time they're spending with the dog as the training goes on, how much time they're spending with the dog. We were also tracking lots of different um, statistics on their phones. So we were pushing different surveys on kind of a semi-regular basis, getting an idea of like, hey, how are you doing today? Um, have you had an like a PTSD um, episode? Have you, what kind of uh, care have you been taking to reduce your episodes? We were really focused on substance use as well, because lots of these people um, found that there was like certain substances that really helped calm them down and bring them down. So we were also kind of relating back, okay, you know, we might not be able to get rid of these episodes, but we can at least reduce substance use and have the dog kind of replace that, which was a, a win in our books as well. Um, and all of this and all of this data collection piece was dictated by them because if we hadn't we would have they wouldn't have proceeded there was moments where they were like hey we are watching wearing these fitbits um and they were like big clunky awful fitbits um not awful but like they're just like big watches right and they're like we can't they like i i see the clock all the time that like when i was in the military that was a thing like we we can't do this we need something that's a little bit better for us so then we worked with them and we made sure that we had a tool that was going to work for them. Um, one of them, one of the or the, the veterans was actually a leather worker because we were working with like, how do we attach these beacons to these dogs collars in a safe way? Like zip ties could scratch the dogs or something, right? Um, so the veterans came up with a way that used like a piece of leather and like a small like metal rivet to attach the beacons and stuff to the dog scholars that they were really comfortable with. And they knew that their animal that they're caring for and training is gonna be safe too, which was super important. Um, and again, just like the whole time we were in high level of communication with them, we made sure that I was super accessible to them. If they had any problems with their phone, I was um, only a phone call away for them to be like, Jenna, this sucks. What is happening? Like, I don't understand. And so then we made sure that it was all on their terms. And um, it bought a lot of, again, like 
participant buy-in, right? If you work with your team and you work with these participants um, and you really, really focus on them, you can get a lot more, I guess, further in a project, a lot less people um, upset with the way you're collecting data, upset with the process and um, ultimately kind of being like, okay, I'm tapping out, right? We avoided a lot of those tap out scenarios by being very in tune with our group of veterans. Um, again, not always the case that like not everybody can always do that, but when you can, it is super, super valuable. Uh, yeah. Okay, so for this one, it was a group of six, six veterans. Like it's quite small, right? So this was, um, again, a kind of trial run situation. Um, so we were seeing best like ways to go about this. And then the goal was then to replicate it uh, to do the larger sample size, like 30 to 40 people. Yeah. But participant oriented data collection. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Some of them actually can uh, consider this variable as a state variables. Yeah. And if you really want to reduce the number of the uh, state variables, uh, you can do some approach. Um, uh, for example, mathematical approach, you can find a relation between the state variable as a, uh, for example, the uh, linear combination. Uh, if uh, you can uh, write one of them as a, a linear combination of others, you can delete it because it has a linear uh, relationship with it. Uh, do you have any special mathematical approach to reduce the number of the state variables? Very good question. Um, I might even direct it to Nate. So I have not done any of those approaches. We've talked about them, but I don't know. Yeah, so, so yeah. the issue of um, what's called uh, model order reduction or dimensionality reduction is a big topic uh, in in dynamic modeling. Um, uh, you don't see it too much on the applied side. I see it a great deal on the engineering side. and. Um, in the context certainly of uh, machine learning where, uh, or analysis of uh, high dimensional data, we can um, use uh, what are called auto encoders, for example, to, um, uh, to, to discover nonlinear relationships between variables and reduce um, uh, the number of, uh, of variables dramatically. Um, and there, there's mathematical reason for this. Often when we have real world systems, like agent-based models, they may, um, agent-based models are perhaps um, very emblematic or you know, exemplary and, and sort of illustrating the fact that uh, the principles of high dimensional systems, because you know, each agent can be uh, in a number of different states, and then you have many, many, many agents. So there's huge number of possible states the models can be in. But the fact is that often it occupies only a small sliver of those states at a, at a mathematical level. So it sort of evolves along with animals. It's a very, very small sliver of possible things. If one person is sick, it's likely that many others will become sick and you don't have every agent in isolation you know, independent of the others. So the fact that they're coupled means it tends to actually be lower dimensional structure in practice. These, these attempts at dimensional reduction though will come much more complicated if you're hoping to elicit causal structure of the problem. If you want to intervene in the system, if you want to reason about the impacts of intervention, want to change it, you know, bend the curve, improve the situation. Um, you have to be very careful with combining multiple variables together um, because the, the, the end product of that may describe system behavior right now um, in, in, you know, in the current, current situation, but it may not be a model that captures the causal structure in a way that if you change something, to understand what its impact would be. So um, I think, you know, for, for the purposes of, of models here, um, using dimensional reduction uh, approaches um, can um, 
you know, can give you ideas for model simplification, but you want to be very careful using it. I mean, you don't want to turn treat it as an automated process at the by any means because it it may clump things together um, in ways that do not reflect causal structure in the system, uh, and and that may lead to very um, uh, very far off conclusions when it comes to intervening in the system to draw from that model. So I'll just say that. Yeah. Hope that helped. Cool. Cool. Yeah. So again, with this case study um, or mini case study, like the example, um, I guess I just wanted to highlight how important uh, involving participants in the process can be um, and they can really like find solutions to roadblocks that best suit them. Um, the next one uh, I'm going to highlight here is we did a group model building event. So kind of like the full fledged thing uh, with a group from health partners in the U.S. Um, all around colorectal cancer screening barriers. And so it was really great. Um, to use causal loop diagrams as this like thinking tool, as this mental model, and then following the steps thereafter, it can then translate into that like agent-based model. With that, often you don't see these direct arrows, not often, but sometimes you don't see these direct arrows like built directly into your ABMs, but these there's like this idea of like flavor or themes of like, oh, people end up with not going to get colorectal cancer screening for X, Y, Z reasons. So then you end up putting kind of barriers or negative connotations into your ABM that reflect those X, Y, Z reasons, right? So there's no direct arrows, there's nothing like that, but there's logic that's built now into like the background of your ABMs um, that kind of represents some of those arrows. Um, again, these are really going to be quite brief little tidbits. If anybody wants to know more about any of these kind of projects, um, either myself or the students who they uh, are more centered on could probably answer more questions later too. Um, and I say that because the next one that I talk about very briefly for one minute is the one done by Wade. Um, and he did it. Now I'm talking about Wade when Wade's in the room. I've never done this before. <laughs> Normally he's not here when I do this. Yeah, perfect. So um, again, really super brief. I'm not going into any details here, um, but it was research done by Wade um, with the Yellow Calls First Nation elders and that community. I'm not even gonna go into any of the stuff, but the concept behind this is one that I pulled out um, is that knowledge translation piece. So how do you do that knowledge translation piece and doing it at the start and at the end and tailoring it to that group of people that you're working with um, is really, really, really important. Um, and I'm sure Wade will talk about that is that's pretty much like, there's a lot of stuff about all of this, that in here. Okay. And then the last one, which is kind of some of the research that I'm doing it um, right now and the stuff that we're focusing on um, kind of progressing forward is looking at um, homelessness and COVID-19 and how those two played a part together. So vulnerable communities in general, like not just the homelessness community, but just vulnerable communities um, were not equitably affected by interventions that were placed on like people as a whole for COVID-19. Um, again, COVID-19, it was an emergency response, right? We were doing the best that we could. Um, it was the best that we could for the general public is the keywords there. And again, that is what we had to do. Like there was no time to go look at exactly how this would impact all the smaller, like minority communities that would not be equitably affected by the different, um, interventions put in place, like lockdown, um, testing was really hard, right. For some of those like minority communities, this is was a huge, huge thing. So we needed to figure out like what interventions would not be harmful for this population so that we can better prepare for future pandemics, right? Now we can give insight on like, hey, this is what doesn't work and this does work, right? Um, 
we can't displace people from homes. So like locking down communities meant that these people who were couch surfers now didn't have a couch to surf on, right? They didn't have a place to sleep anymore. Um, reducing shelter capacities so that it was a more appropriate for COVID, you know, spacing things out. That's great. It helps the people who are in those shelters, but now your bed capacity is reduced. And where are those people going, right? They're still homeless. They're still needing the beds, but they no longer have them. So how does that look? Um, how do you provide testing to somebody who doesn't have a cell phone? You get tested, you do blood testing or whatever um, it happens to be, or you get like a PCR swab test, they get sent back to a lab for a culture. Um, but now how in the world do you tell that person who has now left and you have no way of communicating with that they are positive for COVID, right? Um, so all of those things, again, great for the general public, but not super awesome for some of the minority communities. And in this case, we're focusing on that like homelessness or people affected by homelessness. So we started by building up a model and looking at um, kind of like ways that we can kind of represent this. And then we went, okay, okay, we have to pause here. There's a large element of this community that we're not representing in this because there is very little data on um, how these people interact with each other, right? And from an agent-based model perspective, you wanna know how they move around, right? So I have data on shelters, that's great. But I have no idea who's sleeping on a couch. I have um, very little idea of what makes people go to one shelter versus another because it's usually quite like personal reasons, right? It's they have, um, they don't like the person over there or like they've had something stolen from them at this shelter, never going back there. So I'm gonna go over here. Or I have, um, a substance use um, problem that I'm dealing with. But if I go to that shelter, I know they're not going to support me and I'm probably just going to get kicked out anyway. So like, there's a lot of like pieces at play here that me, myself, um, and even some of the people that were helping build this model, we just like couldn't do alone, right? So we started going to the community and we've kind of drawn on some of the knowledge that we've um, obtained from doing similar, not focused on homelessness and COVID-19, but focused on homelessness and substance use, kind of drawing on some of those interactions that we've had with people with lived experiences um, and like how to go about putting in places interventions and procedures that are gonna best suit that community. Um, what we fell on was, it was the relationship building process that we had done in the past that made those different things successful. Um, when we had gone and talked to some of, um, there's an, a program at, in Alberta and it's called ARCH and it's at the Alberta hospital and they go in and they provide or offer to provide services to people who have gone in with um, substance use problems, whether they go in for an overdose or some other medical condition, but they're like, clearly this person is here for other reasons and this is what it is right now, but you know, there's stuff going on in their life that they can't support themselves. The ARCH program goes in and offers those supports. Um, whether that's getting them uh, stable housing, whether that's getting them an eye doctor's appointment because they don't have glasses and that's why they can't get a, a job or, you know, that they work with those people. And again, it, it's all these homelessness community, vulnerable individuals, these people who are minority and usually stigmatized. Um, and talking with some of the people who've gone through the ARCH program, your biggest advocates are the people you've worked with in the community. So there was a gentleman and he had gone through the program and he was super well known in his community, right? Um, he knew everybody. He was like that touch point, that key person. And he was uh, one of the reasons that others would go through the ARCH program because he had gone through it, he'd seen the research and the development done, and he'd seen the value in it. And he went and talked to all the other people in his community and said, hey, this is what they're doing. You can get help too, right? And those words coming from somebody that they trusted went 
miles. It's huge what that can do for somebody who is marginalized and stigmatized. Me as a researcher, I could go in or, you know, somebody even leading the arts program could go and be like, hey, this is what we do. We'll help you guys. That will not work as well as him going to in and being like, hey, this works because I have no relationship with them yet, right? They don't know me. They've maybe had other interactions with researchers before, but it doesn't always go well. Um, a lot of these communities like are, are stigmatized and they don't have good relationships with authority figures, highly, highly educated people. Like all of that sort of stuff plays into this component of like, how do we do this research, but also take these things and give it back to the community? How are we gonna make sure that this is successful? And those were the principles that we were like, okay, we got to base this one too on all of those principles. So we are working on planning a group model building event. Um, we are in the process of doing the funding and all the fun things that go along with like academic research um, and really prioritizing that like relationship building aspect with this community, because we know that it's going to be super, super critical to effectively deliver results, effectively deliver knowledge translation, and effectively um, provide interventions. When you have the buy-in of a community, it can go miles in actually kind of pulling through. So at a high level, again, benefits, I say group of group model building, but again, of participant-oriented research, participatory research in general. Um, you can create data collection that is best for the participants. You can use great communication tools, right? Like it gives you this whole like pocket of like, hey, these are the things that we can talk about. And now I can show you a way to talk about them, right? Um, we can communicate systems thinking, like high level black box, scary stuff. Um, and we can communicate it in an effective way with people who don't know that, right? We want to be able to bring the computer science to people or bring the like the systems thinking to people and be able to bring their knowledge back to the systems thinking too. Um, the great thinking and mental models that can be created with this stuff. Again, you're never going to press go on a, or run on a causal loop diagram, but they're really, really good um, thinking or mental models. You create these meaningful stories working with these people that fill in data gaps. I don't know why somebody doesn't go to one homeless shelter versus the other, but they do, right? And they know why their friend does. Um, so that really, really can help build dynamic pieces that help your models. Um, knowledge translation at the start and the end of something, right? Working with communities, creating buy-in, and then that whole aspect that even if you didn't have a systems diagram that came out of the end of this, is that being intentional about the relationships that you're building with the communities that you're trying to do interventions with or anything um, creates community buy-in, right? You work with three or four people from that community, you bring them in for the day, you go, you sit down, you work with them on a regular ongoing basis, you go back to them and they go back to their community and they go, hey guys, if we mask, I know it sounds horrible and I know it sounds awful, but if when you're sick, you put on a mask, it's gonna help you know, our elders or it's gonna help our children. And when those community people who are best friends or neighbors of things, they go in and say that stuff and they kind of bring that back to their community so much. It does so much, um, more than we could ever do alone. So yeah, that's kind of where my passion lies, guys. So. Thank you for listening. Um, is there any, I guess, questions about some of the stuff we've talked about today? Any of the process elements? Um, I don't know. Yeah. Anything? Thanks, Nona. If we have a couple spare minutes, you might want to put up Scriptopedia and show it. It's I, a I think we're good. Yeah, okay, yeah. that's fine.
Okay, cool. Not yet. Okay. Um, great. Uh, so, uh, great. So, if people want to take five minutes, uh, we can put them through the next material. Remember, we're going to go to lunch in less than an hour. So, uh, because of the problems with the football team yesterday. Uh, so, uh, we drifted that early, probably about an hour. So, but if you want to, uh, uh, use five minutes and then we can we can get started. I don't know how to. I guess stop all the ones. What's that? What's that? Stop the record. Uh, yeah, this new Zoom interface is. Oh, there it is. You know, it's it. <laughs> 